This is part two of subtopic 1.1, global warming and climate change. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at uh, another phenomenon known as ocean acidification and its impact on the environment. This is going to link into these two science understandings, which is what we're going to cover. Ocean acidification is caused by the ocean absorbing higher levels of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, we've got a few points of things that we need to be able to uh, do, which we'll go through in a moment. And the skeletons and shells of many marine organisms are made of calcium carbonate and are vulnerable to dissolution at low pH. In terms of the so-called intended student learnings, we're going to need to describe and write equations to show how carbon dioxide lowers the pH of the oceans. And something that we have actually covered in stage one chemistry, and I've just noted their subtopic 5.3, which is the pH scale. Uh, we looked at calculating the pH of solutions given the concentration of H plus or OH minus or vice versa. I'll give you a bit of a, I guess, a revision or a recap of it, but I'm not going to go through any of the calculations. I think we'll leave that for class time. And with the second understanding, write equations for carbonates reacting in acidic solutions. Again, that's something that we have covered, but I'll uh, cover it again given this particular context. So what exactly is ocean acidification? Um, we know it links into carbon dioxide emissions and just to provide you with a bit of background, we say that carbon dioxide is a non-metal oxide. That's because it's made up of non-metals. Non-metal oxides, we classify them as acidic oxides. You might recall this from last year in acids and bases. Uh, we know that uh, Non-metal oxides or acidic oxides can react with water and produce acids, which we call oxyacids. So carbon dioxide can effectively dissolve or react with water and form an acid known as carbonic acid. I've given it as this balanced chemical equation here. We can see CO2 as a gas reacting with water, going to produce H2CO3 as an aqueous solution. From that point, we know acids are proton donors. So in solution, uh, these acids can donate protons to water. And being diprotic, or in other words, containing two protons, carbonic acid can do this in two stages. H2CO3 in aqueous solution reacts with water. It's going to give a proton to water to form hydronium ions. And it's going to form HCO3 minus, which is called the hydrogen carbonate ion. This hydrogen carbonate ion can then further ionize. This one's not as readily going to occur compared to the first equation. Um, it's going to also produce more hydronium, but it's going to then produce CO3 2 minus, which is the carbonate ion. So we can see two stages of ionization. This ionization we know produces hydronium ions or we can think of them as hydrogen ions, but keep in mind hydrogen ions don't actually exist free in water or in solution. Um, and if we go back to um, our work in stage one chemistry, back in um, subtopic 5.3, the pH scale, we should all be aware that pH is effectively a relative measure of the concentration of hydrogen or hydronium ions in solution. And we can represent it in this formula here, where pH is equal to the negative log of the concentration of H+. Plus. Keep in mind the square brackets represent concentration of whatever's in between. Or that's equal to the negative log of the concentration of hydronium ions. This one's probably the more familiar one for you guys, but you have to keep in mind both essentially mean the same thing. From this, we can recall another fact. We know that in pure water, there are actually small but equal concentrations of two species, which are the hydrogen or hydronium ion, as well as hydroxide ions, due to water undergoing what we call self-ionization. If we have a look here, we can see two different equations that effectively represent the same thing. So two waters, one water can donate a proton to another water. In doing so, it's going to form a hydroxide ion. The one that gains a proton is going to form a hydronium ion and they form with a one-to-one -one ratio. Alternatively, we can think water breaking apart and forming hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. It's not technically true, but we represent it anyway. So 
What this means is that the concentration of hydronium or hydrogen ions is going to be the same as the concentration of um, hydroxide ions, and that's going to be a very small concentration of 10 to the minus 7 moles per litre or molar. If we use the formula for pH, we can find out that the pH um, of pure water is going to be equal to 7 if we just follow the equation. We also know that you can measure what we call the pOH, which is the relative concentration of hydroxide ions in solution, and it looks virtually the same as the formula for pH. And if we plug that in, we can see that the pOH is also equal to 7, like the pH. So given the pH of a solution, the concentration of H plus can actually be determined. So this is like going the other way around. If we know the pH, we can work out the concentration. So looking at the formula for pH, if we rearrange it, I'm not going to go through it today, uh, the concentration of H plus or H3O plus is going to be equal to 10 to the power of negative the pH. And looking at the formula for pOH, concentration of hydroxide ions is going to be equal to 10 to the minus pOH. If you were to substitute the values for the pH and pOH into these equations, you would actually end up getting concentrations being equal to 10 to the negative 7 moles per litre. And you can check that if you'd like. So where's all this going? So we know if we were to take pure water and add the pH and the pOH together, which is 7 plus 7, we're going to get a value of 14. Uh, alternatively, we can look at uh, multiplying the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide ions together, which is 10 to the minus 7. So if we multiply these two together, we get a product of 10 to the minus 14. This 10 to the minus 14 is what we call the ionization constant, which we represent as K subscript W. And it turns out that this uh, rule is essentially true for any solution that we deal with. So it's not just useful for water, but it's useful for any type of solution where we want to work out the pH, the pOH, the concentration of H plus or the concentration of OH minus. And like I said earlier in this video, um, we'll spend some class time looking at how we can use these formulas to solve for various um, questions. And uh, a thing you can do is just refer back to my videos back in stage one, subtopic 5.3. Let's link this now into ocean acidification. So again, just to recall back to stage one chemistry, we know that acids react with various substances such as carbonates and hydrogen carbonates and the products they produce are carbon dioxide, water and a salt and that's given by this general word equation here. Seawater is generally concentrated with calcium carbonate. I can also tell you that it is mildly alkaline. It has a pH of roughly 8.4 and marine calcifying organisms actually use this calcium carbonate to construct their shells and skeletons. These uh, organisms consist of things like coral, they consist of crustaceans, as well as mollusks. So they represent a, a massive component of many uh, aquatic ecosystems. Ocean acidification can weaken the structures of these calcifying organisms. Given that they are made up uh, quite heavily of calcium carbonate, we can see here that carbonates react with acids, they're going to produce carbon dioxide, water, and a salt. More specifically, calcium carbonate, we can think of as reacting with an acid like hydrochloric acid. We can see it producing CO2, water, and the salt in this case is calcium chloride. Better yet, we can generalize because all acids effectively work the same. So in this ionic equation, we can see that calcium carbonate as a solid can react with H+, which effectively represents an acid in solution. It produces CO2 and H2O, but it also produces calcium ions. So this shows you the calcium carbonate effectively breaking down and then becoming somewhat soluble. It also produces more carbon dioxide, which could prove to be a further concern, given that carbon dioxide can form carbonic acid. So 
this increased acidity, uh, sorry, this increased acidity is going to then reduce the availability of carbonate ions for the construction of shells and skeletons. And so we can expect there to be uh, widespread death, essentially, of these calcifying organisms, which many other aquatic organisms, and including other uh, land organisms, may depend on. So you can see some of the extreme effects that uh, global warming and climate change can have on not just us, but other organisms and on the environment in general. Bit of a grim message to finish up on, but that's it from me, and I'll see you guys in class.